of um, cycling. There's lots of cycling websites out there that will tell you what to ride, lots of cycling websites that will tell you how to ride it and how to get fit from riding your bike. Um, that's not really the sort of thing I'm interested in. What this is all about is about where to ride your bike, good places to ride it, safe places to ride it where hopefully you won't get blown down by a truck. Um, interesting places for a weekend ride and good places to commute. So there's a whole lot of editorial and there's a whole lot of cartography, but what I'm mostly going to be talking about today is the blue team. And that's all based around a map, so you see a bit more of that later on. Now, before I get into it, quick question. Did anyone here um, cycle today? Excellent. Right, excellent. So that's pretty good, Jake. That's pretty good. So you know that the challenge of um, cycling anywhere, not least London, is that the places you want to cycle aren't always too friendly. Uh, that's the Marlborough Road. Road. Uh, it's got a bus lane down the side of it. In London, the bus lane is often where you're told to cycle, which you know, has got a fairly big design floor and it usually has a bus in there. Um, it also has a taxi coming up to the junction, which is just where you like some protected bike space. So not always as good as you think it might be. Sometimes the powers that be are kind and generous and give you a cycle route, and the cycle lane is sometimes lovely and sometimes nice and kind and safe, and sometimes it's heap crap. Uh, and th this is uh, one of the more famous examples where the county council, I think, somewhere in Hertfordshire, has put this cycle lane in which asks you to dismount every 10 yards. <laughs> so, that's why we need cycle routing. Um, of course, you know, sometimes there will be a nice cycle route that gets you from A to B. Um, this is one I made earlier. This is if your A is Oxford and your B is Worcester, here is a brand new cycle route for you. Uh, and this is we putting up the signs uh, just in time for the opening earlier this year. As you can see, it was a bit of a wet day, and our VIP turned up an, an hour later to open the route. And there he is, and what I really don't understand is that the water just sort of didn't land on me. <laughs> it, it might just be too shiny, or it might just be this sort of warm of coming out. I don't know. It, it just repels the water, which is brilliant. So, uh, Anyway, there can't be a route from every single A to B, is the point. You know, we have much that it might be nice to have these signs everywhere. You can't have every single combination. So that's where you need cycle routing. Some people are fine without it. Some people are very happy on fast roads. But you know, there's many different types of cyclists. In fact, there's a cycling tribe. Some of you might have heard of um, the species known as the mammal, which is the uh, middle-aged man in lycra. Um, I suppose he's getting on to be middle-aged these days. But the interesting thing is there's a lot of money in mammals. Uh, you look at sort of left-hand side of that, um, mammals, roadies, whatever you want to call them, all of these websites are seeking to give good route planning, good trip planning tools for the mammal. When you get over to sort of the commuter and leisure market, there's not so much. There's cycle streets, which is absolutely terrific, been going a few years, um, and it's very much shed away with these things. Um, there's not much at all, there's not that much for leisure. Um, and to be fair, you wouldn't want to compete, compete with the uh, Rotis guys. You know, you've got uh, sites like Strava there, which are incredibly well funded, incredibly well capitalised. So, what I'm trying to do with Cycle.Travel is something that's a bit more focused towards touring, leisure, and commuting. So, how do we do that? What do we build this on? Well, first of all, you need data of the cycle um, roads which are suitable to cycle on. And if there's any doubt about what that was going to be, it's pretty obviously an open street map. Uh, this is from the Geofabric Map Compare site. You can see top left is um, OpenStreetMap in the cycle view done by Mr. Andy Allen over there, OpenCycleMap. Um, Google Maps, Bing Map, Here Maps, and pretty obviously there's uh, one, one cycleway that's only there on OpenStreetMap, isn't there on any other view. Even if you could get Google's data, even if you paid for Here's data, it really doesn't compare to OpenStreetMap. So that's, that's a nice and easy one. OpenStreetMap gets you about 70% of the way that you need. Some things it doesn't have. It doesn't have contours. You can see it's slightly washed out on the projector, but you can see there's contours to the south of the village. And what you can't see is that um, there's also, again, slightly washed out, a sort of a built-up area outline around the village on that. Now, that's really important for reasons I'll come on to later. Both of those come from the Open Circle, <coughs> bless their souls, and uh, Open Circle <coughs> data, which is hugely useful. I wish they did it for the rest of Europe. Um, and obviously they don't, but it's, um, that, that gets me probably 20-25% of the rest of the way, which is superb. So interoperability between OpenStreetMap and other data sets is quite important. It's also a bit of a challenge. Um, but people, people do sometimes overestimate the difficulty of working with OpenStreetMap data. 
uh, you'll hear a lot about how the tagging, the metadata for it can be inconsistent, uh, how there's four or five different ways to label something. And yeah, that's true, but that means you have to write four or five different lines of code rather than one. It's not the end of the world. What I found more challenging, uh, and I didn't really realise the amount of this until I expanded the scope of the site from Britain to Western Europe, uh, is the difference in levels of coverage. Um, for example, I used to show um, tracks at a particular zoom level, uh, because tracks are good things to cycle along. Um, and this is a bit like, you know, the old head and shoulders advert, where they washed one side of the head with head and shoulders and then generic shampoo. The left hand side of this is the old style I used to have with tracks, and the right hand is without. That's because this is Germany, and the Germans really like mapping the tracks. Uh, when I first unleashed this uh, original style on Germany, looked at it and thought, you know, you can't actually see anything there. So, coping with different, um, different densities of data is more of a challenge with OpenStreetMap. But that's fine, you know, it's a learning curve to using everything, and um, if you're involved in OpenStreetMap, you get used to these things. How do we put all this together to get some roots? Well, we use a piece of software called OSRM stands for Open Source Routing Machine, and it's absolutely lovely. It's a blatantly fast bit of C++, um, and it gives you Google-style routes, basically. Stuff that you can drag around by clicking mouse, dragging to the route somewhere. Um, you can configure it so that it um, prefers quiet roads, prefers um, uh, cycle base, whatever it is, and that's pretty much the essence of what I'm doing. As it stands, if you just download the source, it's a beautiful sleep machine. I didn't quite want a beautiful sleep machine, I thought I wanted to put some extra features on it, so uh, my instance is a bit more like that. Um, in particular, the thing about uh, OSRM is that because it, it effectively pre-computes all the possible routes in the world, um, technical contraction hierarchies, it requires a lot of memory and a really big server to do that, so fair enough. Go and buy a really big server. Uh, eBay is wonderful for many things, and uh, this now sits in my um, so it sounds a bit like Concord, really, but uh, it's still running like Concord, so that's going to be good. So, the way that you get OSRM to build a cycle route, or indeed any other sort of router, is that you program what's called a profile, uh, which is a little piece of code saying if it's a um, if it's a trunk road, then give it this amount of points. If it's a cycleway, give it this amount of points, so on and so forth. Eventually, you get into a profile that prefers cycleways over trunk roads, or vice versa. And this really is the strength of it, um, that you can write something that programmatically takes all the rich data that's in OpenStreetMap and works out how good a given road is from that. This is all done in a programming language called Lua. Uh, Lua is probably best known because people use it for embedded code in games, uh, not least Minecraft. So I'm hopeful that given the last few days um, news that because I use Lua, this means that I'm going to be able to sell the company for $2 billion in a few years' time. <laughs> I may not, but it also means we can put in external sources of data. Um, hills are really very important if you're cycling. Uh, again, unless you're the uh, uh, guy in the yellow jersey from earlier on. Uh, so this is asking cycle.travel to come up with a route uh, through Wales from Abu Dhabi to Bayan, and big deal in the way so it tries to take you a slightly more gentle way up the hill. And a load of other um, information that it pulls in from external sources. One which I added just recently, which I'm quite pleased with, is uh, traffic data. And this comes from the Department of Transport. They have data for how many cars there are on every single stretch of road in Britain. Um, so, pretty obviously, the roads that's got the most cars on are generally the ones you don't want to cycle on. So, put that data in there, and it really improves the quality of the routine. Now, most of the time, all of this data together, um, put together by OSRM, will come up with a suitable route. Sometimes it won't, sometimes there just isn't a decent route from A to B. Uh, and the only solution you have in those circumstances is to patch the infrastructure and to build the cycleway. Um, this is what they're planning uh, up Tottenham Court Road, I believe, and for those of you who live in London, please do write to TFL and say you support it, because that's going to be a marvellous thing. And in life, of those of us um, writing cycle routes is much easier, because we can send them nice roads. But, you know, the proof of putting in all of this, uh, does it come up with good routes? And yes, it does. This is a route I use quite often from uh, little town called Charlie, where I live, to the nearest big town, Whitney in Oxfordshire. Um, before I put a router, router together, I always used to go down the main B road, which wasn't a whole bunch of fun. Uh, actually, the router would suggest a better, uh, better route for me. I use it now. It is a whole lot better. 
Uh, this, I thought, was quite a nice example of the traffic data coming in. This is a longer route from Manchester to Huddersfield. Um, you will see actually there it's going across an A road for most of it, and that seems slightly counterintuitive until you actually go and look at the A road, and there's virtually no traffic on it because it all goes on the M62. So that's a good example of where putting in external data is made for a better route. And that's part of how I got here today from Paddington Station. All of this, as I mentioned, is draggable. Um, quick little gif there of um, dragging the route, so that's how you want to go through that particular place, and it takes it that way. You get the turn by turn instructions and all of that. I'll briefly talk about the cartography and the presentation in general. It's done on a custom map, again made from OpenStreetMap data. What I'm trying to do is bring in the details that are important to cycling really early on in zoom levels uh, and not focus so much on the stuff that isn't important. So you'll see that this is what all the minor roads coming in quite early on. And um, similarly in London, that's actually got quite a dense network of um, street names there using more condensed font because that's important when you find your way around the city. Um, one of the challenges I found in putting the map together is that the, the rules, the sort of style sheet, the styles that work in a rural area don't necessarily work in a city and vice versa. And a really good example of that is pubs. Um, if, you, if you're cycling through the countryside, then you actually want to see where the pubs are quite a long way in advance because there might be a village six, seven miles away and you're a bit thirsty. So you haven't yet widely quite zoomed out. If you have that on a map of London, then the whole place will just be a sea of pubs, which is, you know, a, a lovely thought of it is here, but isn't very useful for finding the way for it to be. So what I actually end up doing is having slightly different styles for urban and rural areas, and that's where the Ordnance Survey data comes in very useful, because they've got these super polygons of all the towns and um, villages in Britain. So I'll just say, if it's a big town, if the pub is within one of these polygons, then don't bother showing it till you're quite a long way zoomed in. And that doesn't make any difference. A couple of other features to finish. Um, obviously, I can't quite afford a fleet of Google Street View cars, and Google, for their own reasons, don't send the Street View cars down the sort of rubbish tracks that you might like to cycle on sometimes. Fortunately, um, this has already been crowdsourced by this lovely project called Geograph, which a few of you might know. Um, it's a crowdsourcing project for photos uh, of places around Britain. A very, very dedicated community, and it's all openly licensed. So one of the features I've built as part of this, click on the road and or click on the track, and it will show you uh, photos that are taken on there. So I've decided I want to go on a particular track that's marked as a gravel track. There the photos, actually that looks quite cyclical. Turn by turn instructions are important. Uh, this is um, using, in, in a rural area, uh, the instructions actually tell you which villages you're going to go through. You can see there's a little blue headings there, because when you're navigating through rural areas by bike, you tend to go more from village to village than thinking, oh yeah, I've just gone 750 yards, I've got to turn left here. And because filthy Luca has to um, rear its head somewhere and I have to pay for all of this and earn a living, uh, one of the features on the site is that you can book hotels through it. Uh, this is planning a route across southwest Wales, you want to find somewhere to stay, uh, you'll see this little button on the left there that says find hotels. Click that, all these um, magic hotels come up, click on one of those, there's a description of it, check availability, and if you book that very nice hotel, then I guess there's a kickback from it. So, anyway, that's enough about the um, enough about how it actually all works. Really the point of it is this. Uh, on Sunday I had a few hours free, I wanted to go out for a bike ride, I asked it for a bike ride, this is what it gave me. And to me, you know, this really justifies it. This was this was the scene cycling through the Cotswolds. It was a road I've not cycled on before. Um, the route planner said this will be a good road to cycle on, and it was. So for me, that really, really justifies it. Next steps. Well, partly I want to keep making it um, better in the way that it um, had the long avenues that it already follows. So improving the turn by turn directions is important. I want to get a bit more traffic data in there, so it's not just um, good for the A roads. I want to get the cartography better. And at the moment, it's Britain and Western Europe. I'd like to enlarge that in time. But of course, I've mostly been talking about geo, and the other half of that is more. Um, I think, really, for me, the next six, nine months are going to be about bringing some of this to um, mobile apps and um, a mobile site. Cycling is a mobile activity. Uh, at, at present, if I want to find my way across town with cycle travel directions, then 
I print out this, and it's a very, very lovely printout, but it's actually a bit unnerving cycling down Bond Street with this on the handle by as well, taxi to go now. Um, it is doable, I have survived, um, but uh, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to um, get that into the mobile space in the next six months. That's it really, you can try it at cycle.travel, uh, that's us on Twitter, and that's my personal Twitter and email account. So have a play, all feedback, suggestions, ideas, all be welcome. Thank you very much. So basically, I pre compute the data um, using PostGIS or another local to Redis and then um, look at all of that. And it, makes, it makes me sound quite sort of hip using things like Neuro and Redis, which all the cool kids are using, which is great because otherwise I'm an old school Ruby hacker. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Hello. What are you going to do about hills in, uh, in Germany for this service? Are you going to include uh, hills in the an idea of growing? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Hills, um, it uses elevation data to find the route. Um, so, you know, it gives a penalty to steep hills, uh, and if it's really, really steep, it tries its best to not to send you up there at all. Um, and then you can see what, what hills the route is going up because there's a little elevation profile. So, yeah, absolutely. And have you segmented it from mountain biking and other biking? No, um, one of the things about um, OSRM is that because it's got very very heavy memory requirements, uh, every every additional profile you put in would double the memory requirement. And really, that's it's not what I'm aiming at. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to do something that covers all the different types of cyclists. What I'm trying to do is something that will find you a good route and a really good route, and give you the tools by dragging the route and stuff like that to adjust it if you don't like what it's come up. I'm thinking of taking into consideration user feedback. Mm. Like, is it something that you're planning to do? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, what you mean, over particular routes? Yeah, like, do you try to click on that route and say, actually, I don't know, there are more roads than roads. Yeah, um, and, yeah, that's a really interesting one because at the moment there's a bit of a sort of, um, there's quite a few companies, again, mostly using apps to do this, who are getting people to rate particular roads and um, say, you know, I like this for cycling, I don't, um, and aggregating all that data. Now, the challenge there is that it's all becoming very siloed, um, that all of these companies are doing this and making their own data store from it. So Strava are doing it, there's a new, a new bunch who just come out a couple of weeks ago who are doing it. Uh, and there's no one who's actually taking that data and opening it up, which, you know, going by the model of OpenStreetMap would be a better way to do it. Um, some of these guys have sort of said little things about, you know, we will let people who are improving conditions for cyclists use our data, uh, by which they're the local councils and things. If you go to them and say, I'm building a route plan which cyclists use, will they say, brilliant, go for it, or will they say, no, you're not competitors? Is it now your livelihood, would you? Um, it's partly my livelihood. Um, it's not entirely my livelihood because otherwise I would be way thin uh, and uh, reduced to begging on the streets because uh, you, know, you know how these things go. Um, but yeah, it's, it is starting, it's starting to get there um, and I'm doing the geo-freelancing thing over and above that. And what's actually quite nice is that it's, um, it's part of a calling card in itself. Um, people are interested in OSRM, people are interested in routing. And so there's a couple of projects I'm doing for people who've seen this and said, yeah, you know, can we have a bit of that routing magic? Um, I assume the DFD doesn't publish their traffic data already um, joined to the OpenStreetMap IDs. No. Do you want to give an overview of how you combine <laughs> those two data? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, actually, I use OSRM. Um, what the DFT data is, is you have a start point and an end point and the traffic count between those two points. So it says this grid reference to that grid reference along the A5 has got a thousand cars a day. So what you then do is you use OSRM to find an A road route following the A5 from the start point to the end point. You get the OSM IDs out of that and that then gives you the data that you can match up. OSRM is very wonderful in very many ways. 
Well, let's save further questions for the forum. Thanks very much. Thank you.